I've already introduced Marlene Jennings. She is going to be uh, chairing the second panel. Why aren't we there yet? <laughs> Policy guidance based on laws, human rights based approaches and codes of ethics data collection are at the heart of the principles of the practices needed for us to move forward. You just heard the human stories of people directly affected by racial profiling on a daily basis. What do we know about efforts to create the accountability that we've said is so desperately needed so far? What are the obstacles to us moving forward? And Marlene Jennings will be leading us through this challenging conversation. Over to you, Marlene. Thank you, Pearl, and welcome everyone. I hope uh, that you found the conference as interesting as I have just up to date and I hope our session, I know our session will be really uh, interesting and we'll learn a lot. I want to, before introducing our three uh, panelists, I want to quote briefs, therefore public, tabled by the City of Montreal, by the Sûreté du Québec, and by the um, uh, SPVM, Le Service de Police de la Ville de Montréal, before the consultative committee. They're available on the uh, Ministère de la Sécurité uh, Publique's website. All of the briefs that we received are posted there. So on the question of systemic racism, did any of these three organizations, governments, recognize it? Well, yeah, but kinda indirectly. If we go to the Sûreté du Québec, in their uh, brief, they say, vu la gravité des impacts du profilage, and they were speaking about racial profiling, du profilage sur la santé, le bien-être des victimes et de leur communauté, la sensibilité médiatique du dossier et la nécessité d'un du change, changement de culture organisationnelle au sein des corps de police, la sûreté est aussi d'avis que ces initiatives doivent être portées par des gestionnaires crédibles et ayant une influence positive au sein de leur organisme. That's the Sûreté du Québec. Not only are they saying that it takes an organizational culture change, but it needs to be led by leaders who actually have credibility. If we look at the city of Montreal, the city of Montreal just put into um, place la mise sur pied d'un commissaire à la lutte au racisme et aux discriminations systémiques est un autre geste posé par la municipalité afin d'assurer l'imputabilité de la ville en matière de lutte au racisme et la discrimination pour l'atteinte de mesures mesurables. And finally, Faux actually read the uh, quote from the brief that I was going to use, so I'll use another one which also works well. Par ailleurs, and this is for the SPVM, the Montreal Police. Par ailleurs, afin de lutter contre le profilage racial, le SPVM cherche à développer des moyens innovants en matière de rapprochement avec la communauté afin de transformer les biais systémiques dans les pratiques de l'organisation, notamment en matière d'interpellation policière. So I think that provides us with a really nice basis for what we're going to hear from our three academic experts. And I'm going to, I'm assuming that everyone's already read the detailed biographies, that I don't have to spoon feed that to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to ask in this order, Anne-Marie, Dr. Anne-Marie Livingston, then um, uh, Professor Scott Wortley, and um, uh, our youngest, but not the least important, um, Professor Kanika Samuels Wortley. So, okay. Anne-Marie, you're on. Welcome, everybody. Uh, um, thank you very much uh, to the conference organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about the research that um, I've been engaged in, and it was kind of shocking to me to realize that it's been almost 30 years since I um, first started to uh, investigate these issues as a graduate student um, uh, and someone who was hired with the Commission on Systemic Racism in the Ontario criminal justice system. Um, 
the question that we're you know I'm going to try to address over the next 15 minutes, and I'll speak very quickly so I can try to make the points uh, um, that I want to make. Um, is that you know? Is there a question that that you know the new police, uh, uh, the police that we see uh, um, today, are any different than the uh, the, the police um, that we were dealing dealing with 30 years ago um, when I started research on this area? Um, as I said, almost 30 years of experience researching racial bias in the Canadian criminal justice, including the issues of, of uh, racial profiling as uh, defined as uh, the over surveillance of racialized communities. Uh, often through issues of uh, police stop and question frisk um, or street checks. Um, I would argue that, you know, uh, when I first started uh, with the commission um, those 30 years ago, I thought that this would be a, a topic that would be of great interest to the criminal justice system, of great interest to policing officials, of great interest to the go uh, uh, government officials. And uh, was uh, uh, very disappointed to see that, you know, research was not encouraged. Uh, research was something that was frowned upon research on this topic was seen uh, uh, as something that was encouraging uh, trouble or was viewed as radical. Um, and even had uh, some of my early advisors uh, come to me at that time and say, you know, Scott, I don't think it's a good idea to, for you to focus on issues of race and racial comparisons um, because it would damage your career uh, um, and it would uh, close doors and opportunities that you might have uh, otherwise. Um, Often when uh, uh, studies have uh, uh, focused on these issues with a variety of, uh, of methodologies, um, what we've had is uh, a police strategy of denial, uh, deflection and indignation. Um, you know, the, the, the research does not capture reality. We do not engage in, in uh, racially biased activities. There is no difference in the way that we treat uh, um, black and indigenous people and other BIPOC pe peoples than we treat anyone else. Um, this idea of deflection that, well, we have to analyze the research, it, there may be methodological faults. Um, these are issues that uh, can be used to uh, deflect attention away from the police institutions themselves. And in indignation, this idea that we are hurt uh, um, by accusations and allegations of, uh, of racism um, because you know, our, our uh, men and women in policing put their lives on the line every day and try to do our best job to keep the police, to keep the community safe. And we're hurt by these allegations that we engage in unprofessional activities. Um, when I look back, and this is the argument I'll make here in a minute, I have cautious optimist, uh, optimism with respect to recent changes. Um, I have witnessed more meaningful reform in the, the last two years than in the previous 28 years um, for a variety of different reasons. But I'm still, uh, I would only say cautiously optimistic because I'm still quite cynical. Um, and realize that you know a moral panic over uh, gangs or other types of uh, criminality or terrorism um, could very quickly turn the tide, um, and a counter narrative will eventually uh, um, emerge that might uh, reduce, slow, or even reverse some of the reforms that have been made over the last couple of years. There's still a very long uh, uh, way to go, a very long fight uh, before racial equality um, in the just Canadian justice system and broader society um, can be achieved. Um, Canadian research, and uh, I'll be very quick on, on, on racial profiling, uh, can be categorized into three uh, major types of methodology. Um, there's been a great deal of qualitative research. These would include ethnographies, focus groups, stakeholder interviews, uh, community consultations. I've sat on a number of different inquiries um, and have heard the painful uh, uh, stories uh, of uh, uh, community members from uh, uh, the Black community, from the Indigenous community, from other BIPOC, BIPOC communities, as they relay uh, uh, the encounters that they've had with the police and racial profiling incidents and, and how, from an emotional and practical point, they've terribly impacted their lives, much like um, the, the stories that we heard uh, earlier in the first session today. And one of the things that I can say um, when looking at this research is that they really do drive home uh, um, the, the, the pain, the frustration, and the impact um, that these incidents have. But in the early days, particularly, you know, the first decade of this type of research were summarily dismissed by police officials as anecdotal. I've heard police officials dismiss such stories as uh, one-sided, as not uh, uh, capturing the truth, uh, as lies or misrepresentations. Um, or even as stories told by the, the family members of criminals uh, to try to make the police look bad, that you know, purposely because they have a bone to pick 
uh, by the police. Um, a second, you know, and, and it's a travesty that this is happening. Um, a second form of methodology are general population surveys, uh, which directly compare the experiences and perceptions of people from different racial backgrounds. These surveys have also shown profound racial differences um, in exposure to uh, stop, question, frisk activities, and profound differences in perceptions uh, of policing and the justice system in Canada. And finally, we've got um, the release of police statistics on things like street checks and traffic stops that have validated uh, uh, very powerfully um, the qualitative research and the general population surveys that came before. Um, and it's only, in my opinion, once these statistics have been released, often through contested freedom of information uh, um, requests, um, that the public has started to you know, think that maybe uh, there's something to do with some of the uh, um, uh, uh, racial biases uh, that have been alleged. And when I say the public, I, I'm generally meaning the white public. And uh, I think uh, uh, the lived experiences of indigenous, black and, and other BIPOC peoples, um, they know uh, uh, that this is true. This is their lived history. This, these are their lived experiences. Um, but often when dealing with uh, the white population, they've kind of sat back and said, well, I hear these allegations, I hear these denials, but I need to see data or evidence um, you know, uh, to convince me one way or the other. Um, and research, I think the, the, the contribution that it's made is uh, providing that evidence. Um, this is an example of a high school survey that we did a few years ago. There's been a number of them that have uh, replicated these exact findings, um, showing that black students uh, were much more likely to report that they had been stopped, questioned, searched by the police in the past two years um, than their uh, white and black counterparts. Our research has also shown that you know when you control for other things, driving patterns, uh, um, the community that you live in, and importantly in this case, uh, criminal activity, that racial disparities are not uh, uh, diminished. In fact, uh, uh, controlling for criminal behavior, racial disparities and exposure to the, to the police actually become stronger. Um, become more important, more statistically significant, because racial differences in, in exposure to the police are strongest among those with low levels of criminality. Um, the, the police use race as a master status, what these data show, um, that attracts their attention over and above uh, um, uh, um, actual involvement in, in, in drug use uh, or, or other illegal activities. These are examples of some of the uh, um, uh, street check data, official street check data. This is street check data uh, um, from Toronto over a five year period when the Toronto police conducted well over 2 million street checks. Um, these are the rates for young men, uh, um, you know, 15 to 24 years of age. And you can see from the police, the police zone data that there was, you know, nine stops for every uh, young black person in the Toronto population during this time, uh, time period. Um, three stops for individuals uh, identified as brown, um, and it drops to only 1.4 for young white men and, and lower for other racialized groups. These are profound racial differences that have been replicated in a number of different studies. These are, this is the Ottawa Police Services traffic stop data. The data were collected by the uh, Ottawa police officers themselves. Again, show profound racial differences in exposure to uh, traffic stops. And this is a study from a recent inquiry we conducted in uh, Nova Scotia in the Halifax region, once again showing that the, uh, um, the annual average street check rate for black men uh, um, uh, was many, many times uh, greater than that for white men. And in fact, the, the rate for um, um, uh, black women was higher than the rate for, for black men. But I'm using these, there's a lot of detail and methodological details that can, that can be discussed with respect to these, but they strongly demonstrate, and I don't think there's any um, debate anymore. Um, initially, 30 years ago, when we talked about these data, there would have been, there's no evidence. There's a lot of evidence that's been collected now, uh, both qualitative, uh, both from the voices of, of indigenous uh, black and BIPOC people, but also from surveys and also from official police data. I don't think we can debate this anymore. Um, what have been the standard reform uh, practices? And I think uh, Anne-Marie uh, rel uh, relayed this a little bit. In my opinion, there's been kind of four that are often uh, touted as dealing with the issue. Um, and this has uh, been the same over the last 30 years. First and foremost, training. We're going to have anti-bias training. We're going to bring this in. Um, I think that a lot of the anti-bias training that has been proposed has been public relations uh, training. Um, and I'll say this for the, uh, the following reasons. 
public re uh, relations training is training that does not involve any teeth or any accountability, where officers just have to take the course and take uh, tick the box. They do not have to demonstrate competence. Um, police have very rigorous standards for acceptance. And you know, the Ontario Police College officers have to uh, swim two lengths of an Olympic swimming pool to become a police officer, but they do not have to pass cultural competency training. It is something that they have to take. Uh, in most cases, they could literally sleep through it uh, and still be certified as having this, this training. We need to develop training that uh, officers are going to have to take seriously and are going to have to demonstrate competence, much like they have to demonstrate competence in many other areas of their profession. Um, community policing um, often is brought in, uh, you know, to uh, provide uh, communities with positive interactions with police. We've, you know, heard about barbecues, sports events, uh, uh, school resource officers, the list can go on. Um, even in a city like Toronto, we've had uh, instances where we have uh, uh, the Toronto Anti-Violence um, Initiation Strategy, Tavis, uh, we go in aggressive, proactive policing, stop, question, search, uh, in what they would deem high crime communities. And then they would hold barbecues once a month to try to counteract almost kind of a good cop, bad cop strategy. Um, the research strongly suggests that that does not increase trust in, in police communities. Um, uh, people are more impacted by their negative interactions with the police than they are by fleeting positive interactions. Uh, community consultations, diversity hiring has also been. Have these uh, strategies, which I think uh, have been the most prevalent um, in the, in, uh, at least uh, most prevalent that have been uh, provided or uh, uh, proposed by the police themselves. Have they uh, uh, these efforts reduced racial bias and increased police legitimacy? I would strongly say no. Um, we've done three major surveys in the Toronto area. This is an illustration. This question, uh, among many, uh, they're very consistent. We've asked people, do you believe that the police treat Black people the same uh, um, or uh, uh, better or worse uh, than white people? These are the respondents who believe that uh, um, uh, the police treat Black people worse um, than, than white people. You can see in 1994, 76% of the Black population thought the police treated uh, um, black people worse. Um, by uh, uh, 2007, this had jumped up uh, to 81% um, and 82%. So when we look at the black population, there has been no significant increase. If anything, perceptions of the police have gotten worse. They're consistent across other questions that we've asked. What we do see, however, um, is an increase in white and uh, 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 Asian respondents who are actually identifying and recognizing anti-black racism. Um, which uh, may uh, uh, you know, turn out to be a positive thing with future reforms. Um, have street checks. Another major initiative that has been uh, uh, produced is um, street check regulations or the in fact banning of street checks by major police services across the country. Has that made a difference? I don't think it has. Um, this is official street check numbers in Ontario, which has a very rigorous uh, street check regulation condition. As you can see in Toronto, um, you know, between 2008 to 2013, there was over 300,000 street checks conducted each year and formally documented by the Toronto Police, reached a pinnacle of over 400,000 in 2012, um, dropped uh, uh, dramatically when some new reforms were initiated in 2014. Um, there was a moratorium uh, for a few years uh, while the, the, the study, uh, while these uh, um, issues were studied. Um, since the regulation in 2017, when it was brought in, there was only 25 street checks. And now uh, in 2019, the most recent data, uh, the official street check count re uh, released by the Toronto Police is one street check. Um, Scott, by sorry yes? to interrupt. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. All right. Uh, uh, sorry for the, the, the time. That's okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to straight with, with, with respect to street checks was when we go back to our surveys and we ask these issues, um, what we find um, is that, in fact, the, the proportion of black, sus, uh, black respondents who are stating that they have been stopped, questioned, and searched by the police has actually increased over this 25-year uh, uh, period, not decreased. So you can see that the proportion of black respondents rose from 17% in 1994 to 26% in 2019, even though street checks were implemented in 2017. Um, there are some new reforms that we can talk about that I think are positive. A uh, big thing that I think has, has changed is the initiation of race-based uh, uh, data collection. I think that race-based data collection is not only um, a research exercise, 
um, I think it's an accountability measure, uh, 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 um, an accountability uh, measure um, that uh, will ensure that police take these issues uh, seriously. Um, I can elaborate on that in the question answer period. Finally, I want to say what the challenges are. Um, I think the major challenges with respect to meaningful reform are going to be the activities of police association who have a great deal of economic and political clout. I think there's still a great deal of white apathy and ignorance with respect to these issues, although a sensitivity towards uh, uh, bias issues has uh, uh, um, increased, I think, and there's some evidence with respect to the allyship that has been shown, for instance, to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, anti-Black and Indigenous racism, racialized fear of crime, threats of depolicing is a big one, artificial intelligence and statistical discrimination, I think, is going to be a major challenge. Um, growing economic inequality, and I will stop now. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Super interesting. I'm not even going to ask you any questions because I want Kanika to have her voice heard. Kanika, the mic is yours. Thank you, Marlene. Academics can really talk for sure. Um, I want to thank the uh, organizers for this opportunity to be here. And also, it's an honor to be alongside Marlene uh, Jennings, as well as Drs. Anne-Marie Livingstone and Scott Wortley. So I don't have a PowerPoint today, but I do want to start with a story that a, re a youth recently shared with me. My friends and I were having a small campfire at a school field after hours. Somebody called to report a fire or the smoke, so the police ended up showing up. We all got kind of scared, so my friends started running. The first thing the cop did was pull his gun and point it towards us. I was explaining that we were having a small campfire and roasting marshmallows. He was asking me questions like who I was and what I was doing with the gun pointed at me the whole time. After I explained everything to him, he kind of just made me put out the fire. He didn't put his gun away until I put out the fire. Then nothing went further. I was 13. This is how a young black woman experienced an encounter with a police officer in Toronto. Hearing these stories are important to understand why there continue to be tensions between the police and the black community. Stories like these, I am sure horrify the public, including members of the police community. However, traditionally we have privileged and accepted the voices of police officials who deny the extent of racism within law enforcement over members of the racialized communities who have in fact experienced it. A growing number of Canadian studies reveal that as a result of negative encounters with the police, Black peoples and Black youth in particular have low confidence and trust in the institution that is meant to serve and protect them. As such, I argue that Black youth voices need to be amplified because some of their experiences do challenge socially constructed beliefs of equality in our country. By centering Black voices and acknowledging the role that racial bias plays in our criminal justice system, we may begin the process of dismantling the harms of racism in our country. Policing is one area that warrants specific attention due to its role in the criminal justice process. As the initial point of contact with members of the community and the discretion and coercive power to determine whether one's behavior is criminal or not, police are the gatekeepers to the justice system. Of course, some scholars and police advocates will argue that the police only target individuals who commit crime and that higher rates of offending among black people is what accounts for their overrepresentation in our criminal justice system. However, research reveals racially biased policing behaviors and practices also contribute to racial disparities in our justice system. As noted, for decades, Black communities in Canada have raised concerns that they are subject to higher levels of police surveillance or subject to racial profiling, which reflects the belief that officers often focus on the race of the civilians rather than individualized suspicion or behavior. But what does racial profiling look like? What does it feel like? We did hear a few stories from our first panel. However, I wanna to turn to a few narratives from two young black men from my study on youth experiences with the police. The first states, there's a group of us that got stopped. I was the only black guy in the group. So they weren't talking to anyone else and only made eye contact with me. And they're asking me about a crime, something had happened at school and someone got robbed. They wanted to take me in for questioning for absolutely no reason. For me, I feel like if that's the case, why stop me and ask me and why not everyone else around me? This youth goes on to state this about police. You can't trust them after that. When you're a youth and you see that, you kind of make mental notes. You don't wanna trust them. You don't wanna be around them. You don't wanna respect them. A great deal is described here. Feelings of being treated differently from a group of friends of another racial background, 
feeling singled out because of one's race and subsequent feelings of lack of trust and respect. It's also important to note that this youth's overall perception of police has been strongly influenced by this one negative encounter. Thus encounters with the police that are perceived to be influenced by racial bias are not easily forgotten or dismissed. Another young black man recites the following. I came out of my building and I was walking. I saw a cop was staring at me and I was like, whatever. The cop pulled up beside me and asked what I was doing. He said he wanted to do a search and I said I didn't consent. I was 14 or something. He asked things like, what is your name and trying to get information. I stated that this was racial profiling and he just left. I knew my rights. I think he said something about something happened in the area and I fit the description. I was mad, but you have to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and go on about your day. Out of 10 black kids, eight will experience a racial situation with police. And I feel like it's just something you have to come to terms with. These selected narratives put troubling statistics into the context of lived experience. To illustrate studies conducted in Toronto, Halifax, Montreal, and Vancouver reveal that black people, but more specifically black men are grossly overrepresented in official street check data. Furthermore, a number of surveys have shown that black people are more likely to report multiple police stop and search incidents than respondents from other racial groups. Importantly, racial differences with respect to police contact remain even after controlling for other relevant factors, including gender, social class, neighborhood characteristics, and criminal behavior. In other words, racial differences in police contact cannot be explained away by poverty or involvement in crime. Race matters. If you're a Black man in Canada, the question is not if you'll be sought by police, but a matter of when. As a result, Black people are more likely to be caught for engaging in minor criminal activity than people from other racial backgrounds who engage in the exact same behavior. This is a form of systemic racism. The narratives of some young Black youth suggest that they believe the police aim to criminalize them more than to offer safety and protection. To illustrate, one young Black woman states the following. I think the police represent protection for a certain type of people I think the police are necessary, but it wasn't created to make sure people like me are safe and meant more to put people like me in jails. When I was younger, I would have to call the police a lot because I didn't feel safe. And I would just watch the police treat me and my family like criminals when we were the victims. Another young black woman expressed, police officers say the most fucked up things. The last, one I, the last time I dealt with a police officer, you know what he said to me? He said, see you next time. Like who says that? It was one of the only times that I actually snapped in an officer. I was like, yeah, you're disgusting. You wanna see me again? They're just looking to fill their quotas and get people arrested. They'll make you believe you're a criminal before you're even a criminal. This young woman makes a powerful observation. Police have a significant role in defining and constructing who is a criminal. They decide who is subject to attention and subsequent control. Therefore, focus on racialized communities maintains discriminatory perceptions and negative stereotyping. It's stories like these that correspond with evidence that suggest higher rates of police surveillance in racialized communities may be one of the factors contributing to the overrepresentation of Black peoples in the Canadian criminal justice system. And my own research demonstrates concerns over police discretion and its impact on arrest decisions. To illustrate, our Youth Criminal Justice Act not only advises, but gives police officers the power to choose alternative measures to the traditional court system when apprehending a youth who's committed a crime. This is rooted in research that suggests the court system is not only costly, but inappropriate for most young people who engage in crime. Yet my analysis of police data suggests that in comparison to youth from other racial backgrounds, Black youth are more likely to be charged and less likely to receive an alternative sanction. Involvement with the court system can lead to an array of negative consequences, including societal stigmatization. Furthermore, a criminal record can have a negative impact on both educational and employment opportunities and ultimately lead to further criminal involvement. Therefore, Black people are more likely to face criminal charges and experience court interventions, as my data suggest, they are also more likely to experience the negative consequences of criminalization and labeling. The disproportionate racial charge rates suggest that bias has become embedded in police discretion, and it is these systems that perpetrate systemic racism. 
So while black communities are over-policed in many respects, members of the black community have long raised concerns over police inaction or insensitivity when it comes to their victimization. While the research is scarce, what does exist suggests that black people are at a higher risk of some forms of violent victimization and hate crime than people from other racial backgrounds. However, research also suggests that black people in Canada are less likely to report crime, including their own victimization to the police. My current research seeks to understand why. My analysis of national victimization data demonstrates that young black Canadians have little trust or confidence in the police. And my one-on-one -on -one interviews with black youth in Toronto demonstrate that this lack of trust decreases youth's motivations to report crime. This lack of trust is directly related to experiences of harsh and inadequate treatment by law enforcement officials. To illustrate, many youth report that when they have reported crime to the police in the past, the police treated them as a crime suspect rather than as a crime victim. Others feared that reporting victimization to the police could lead to police use of force against them or their family members. This places black youth in a vulnerable position, both due to their increased risk of violent victimization, as well as a lack of trust in an institution that is meant to serve and protect them. Therefore, this is not only an example of systemic racism, but an issue of public safety. So why do we continue to see harms perpetrated against members of the black community? Why aren't we in a better place? I turn to part of former Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders' resignation speech. In July 2020, in the midst of our global pandemic and growing calls to reform the police institution, in his message to the public, he states, we, as in the police, never stop. We always listen and serve with compassion. Accountability and transparency are the fabric of public trust. Public trust is the fabric that creates community safety. And as an organization, I wanna reassure you that we recognize above all else, the Toronto Police Service will continue to do everything that it can to ensure the public trust is at the forefront of every word and every deed. But right there lies the problem. Despite global calls for significant police reform, police officials continue to push hopeful and positive narratives that fail to address the cynicism and frustrations of racialized communities, as well as the sluggish pace of meaningful reform. Such statements continue to ignore the voices of those who are affected the most. As a researcher, I argue that we do in fact need to have more transparency from publics, from police services in order to document racism and evaluate the impact of initiatives that aim to address anti-racism and decrease public trust, we require improved race-based data collection, access, and dissemination. We also require a commitment to work with researchers, including researchers of color and members of the Black community who are willing to make critical inquiries into law enforcement practices. We can no longer rely on researchers or community officials that just give police the answers they're looking for. So I wanna end with a quote from another participant in my study. This young black woman states, not every officer is bad, but as an institution, the police gives those with biases a space and platform to target people with, within those groups without recourse. This is a powerful statement that acknowledges the issue that the issue of bias is more than just a problem with individual offers, officers, but permeates the institution. We can no longer look away from the insidious harms of racism within policing. We're at a time where citizens are expressing concern over racial bias in Canadian policing. In fact, a recent poll suggests that 40% of Canadians believe the police treat, that the police treat Black, Indigenous, and persons of color unfairly. For decades, police services and policymakers have deflected concerns over racial bias and have failed to conduct the appropriate research and reforms that are necessary. But now the country is watching. This is a vital opportunity to implement the necessary policies needed to demonstrate that police and government officials are listening to Canadians in general and members of the black community in particular. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Kanika. Um, we've gone over time and to allow the other panel justice, I'm going to not ask any questions and hope that during the question period, there will be questions directed to you. But I do wanna thank the three of you for powerful presentations. 